It's said that the enigmatic and counterintuitive nature of time lies at the heart of our modern day theories. Clocks in different states of motion tick at different rates. Therefore, time is relative. But what if there were a completely different way of looking at things? One surprisingly more mechanistic and intuitive. Indeed, something remarkable emerges when we decide to treat relativity not as a theory about space, time, or kinematics, but rather as a theory about waves. This is Dialect with what time dilation actually is. Imagine that you're going to build yourself a pair of clocks. But these won't be any old clocks, rather special clocks, which tick using sound waves. The concept is simple. At one end of the clock, you'd have a detector waiting to receive a particular sound wave, which, upon its arrival, would cause that detector to register a tick of its clock. This detector would then reflect or re-emit that sound wave back towards a second detector at the other end of the clock, which would in turn receive it, register another tick, and once more re-emit the wave back. Thus, with a sound wave continually passing between the two detectors, you'd have constructed a viable instrument for measuring the passage of time. Now you make the following claim. Using these clocks, you can prove that time is relative. To do this, you keep one clock ticking at the same location and proceed to fly the other clock around the world. Ideally, this flown clock should be as aerodynamic as possible. Additionally, it should not be enclosed in any structure, but rather exposed to the open. Now, when the clocks are reunited, you find that less time has elapsed on the traveling clock than on the stationary one. What caused this discrepancy? Well, the answer is simple. Sound waves travel through the medium of air and do so always at the same speed, the speed of sound, regardless of the speed of the source which emitted them. This means a sound clock in motion will function essentially differently from a sound clock which is at rest. To see this, let's label the speed of sound as C and observe how the ticking of a sound clock at rest compares to one in motion. If the distance between the detectors is D, then for a clock at rest with respect to the air, the time it takes a sound wave to travel that distance will be D over C. But if the clock is in motion, the distance that the sound wave has to travel between detectors now becomes greater than D meaning it takes a longer amount of time for the wave to travel that distance and thus a longer time for the moving clock to tick. This relationship between ticks on the two clocks can be easily quantified via some simple trigonometry. First, for a clock moving at velocity v, let's label the distance which the sound wave has to travel between detectors as d prime. Now, the at-rest clock ticks once every d over c seconds, while the moving clock ticks once every d prime over c seconds. The ratio between ticks of the clocks is thus d prime over d. We next note that in the time d prime over c that it takes the moving clock to tick, the clock itself will have traversed a distance v times d prime over c. We can now see that d, d prime, and v times d prime over c all form a right triangle. And thus, via the Pythagorean relation, we can express d in terms of d prime. That is, d equals the square root of d prime squared minus v times d prime over c squared. Plugging this expression into our ratio, we can factor out the d prime in the denominator and cancel it with the d prime in the numerator.
to leave the expression 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Look familiar? Well, it should, because it turns out that a sound clock in motion with respect to the air will experience an effect exactly analogous to that which we understand in relativity to be the phenomenon of time dilation. That is, the sound clock's rate of ticking will be slowed down by a factor determined via the relativistic expression for gamma. But with C here standing in for the speed of sound instead of the speed of light. An awful coincidence, right? Well, the similarities don't end there. For instance, let's consider what happens to two sound clocks that are separated and then later rejoined. In the earlier example, when we flew a sound clock around the world, the clock which remained stationary with respect to the air wound up showing more elapsed time. But now, let's say we don't know which clock is stationary with respect to the air and which is in motion. Let's consider two cases. First, the case in which the clock that departs, travels away, then turns around and returns, is the one which is in motion with respect to the air. Then, obviously, the stationary clock will tick faster for the entire duration of their separation. And so the traveling clock will show less elapsed time upon their reunion. But now, let's consider the second case wherein both clocks start in motion with respect to the air. In this case, both clocks begin by ticking slowly. Let's label them clock A and clock B. Next, clock B abruptly slows down so it is stationary with respect to the air, while clock A continues traveling off. Once stationary, clock B will actually tick faster than its counterpart. However, if clock B wants to catch back up to clock A, it must do so by traveling through the air at a velocity greater than that with which clock A is already traveling. So let's say clock B spent 5 seconds being stationary with respect to the air, during which clock A traveled away at a velocity of 3 fifths the speed of sound, so that over this duration it recorded only 4 elapsed seconds. Next, clock B travels at a velocity of 4 fifths the speed of sound in order to catch back up to clock A. Traveling at this velocity, it will take clock B 20 seconds to catch back up to clock A. Over this duration, 16 more seconds will have elapsed on clock A, resulting in the clock showing 20 total elapsed seconds. But for this same duration, only 12 seconds will have elapsed on clock B resulting in the clock showing only 17 total elapsed seconds. Thus, when they are reunited, the clock which turned around to catch back up will still show less elapsed time, even though it was at rest with respect to the air during some portions of the trip. Now, we can repeat this experiment assuming any arbitrary initial velocities of our sound clocks with respect to the air and the end result will always be the same. Whichever clock turns around to rejoin its companion will always end up showing less elapsed time. This is in consequence of it achieving a greater total average velocity with respect to the air over the duration of its trip. Likewise, in special relativity, we find that for any two clocks that are separated and rejoined, Whichever clock turned around or accelerated to rejoin its companion will always end up recording less elapsed time. Unfortunately, in special relativity, due to the insistence on preserving the symmetry of observers' differing states of motion, there has never been a clear consensus on what causes time dilation. You can see that even the experts are clearly confused by it, such as when they inaccurately claim that only acceleration causes time dilation, or conflate time dilation with the Doppler effect, or even bequeath unto time dilation the power of causal agency itself. Then, of course, there are the multitude of differing interpretations as to what resolves the twin paradox. 
But in our sound clock universe, something like the twin paradox becomes exceedingly simple. All we need to do is imagine constructing something like, say, humanoid robots, which operate based off of sound signals. Then any functioning in these robots will be affected by their motion through the air, such that they will experience time differently depending on that state of motion. For instance, say we construct two robots that are designed to sprout white hairs when they turn, say, 10 seconds old based on their respective sound clocks. Then, if we separate and rejoin these robots, we'll find that whichever robot turns around or accelerates in order to rejoin its twin will take longer to sprout its white hairs, and thus, in accordance with the results of the twin paradox, wind up being the younger twin. So what does this all mean? Well, essentially, any observable demonstration of time dilation that we can make in special relativity can be mapped to a demonstration of time dilation in our sound clock universe. This strongly suggests we could invert such a mapping and interpret relativity not as some mystical theory about the altering of space and time, but rather as a theory about how, just as sound always travels at the same speed through the air, light always travels at the same speed through some sort of medium. This is a model known as dynamical relativity. Rooted in Lorentz's ether theory, it was revived in modern form around the 1980s after drawing inspiration from the wave mechanics of quantum physics. But in academic journals, it's often presented as merely a heuristic tool, an aid for intuition for incoming students, as opposed to an actual interpretation in its own right. Of course, due to the staunchly entrenched dogmas of modern physics, it's hard to imagine that such papers would ever get published were they to present the idea in any other way. But for the critical thinker, the fact that we can recreate the formalism of relativity in a toy universe wherein information travels via sound waves instead of light waves should set off some pretty serious alarm bells. Well, okay, but you might object that we haven't recreated the entire formalism of relativity, just parts of it. Indeed, let's recap what we have done so far. First, we've shown that time dilation can be interpreted as a mechanistic effect of setting clocks in motion relative to a medium. Then, we've shown that if you don't know what your motion is relative to that medium, no coincident comparisons of clocks i.e. comparisons where clocks have been separated and then rejoined, will ever reveal it to you. Lastly, we've shown that if information itself is assumed to be transmitted through this medium, then this dilation effect isn't just limited to clocks, but rather extends to anything that relies on that information for its functioning. If you're familiar with relativity, you've likely already seen time dilation derived in a mechanistic-like Pythagorean manner for light clocks before, so the first point shouldn't be too surprising. Similarly, you're probably already aware that the speed of light is also conjectured to be the speed of information, so the third point shouldn't reorient your understanding much either. But the second point gives us something crucial and new because it offers us a sort of uncertainty principle for clocks. That is, since no clock-based measurement could ever be used to determine our motion with respect to the ether, this means there's no way to tell if our clock is ticking in accordance with true universal time, or if it is ticking at a dilated rate. Meaning, it is not time itself which is relative, merely our knowledge of it. Now, this precipitates an epistemological conundrum of sorts, because any uncertainty in time-based measurements will propagate as uncertainty in other types of measurement. For instance, given a known distance, we'll find that any judgment of velocity will be subject to the uncertainty of our time judgment, since moving observers would unknowingly judge their velocities to be greater. Conversely, given a known velocity, it then becomes judgments of distance which suffer this uncertainty. 
since moving observers traversing such distances would unknowingly judge them to be shorter. Which brings us round to our essential conclusion. When we derived gamma for our sound clocks, the V and C stood for velocities with respect to our medium of air, and subsequently all our use of these quantities represented measurements that were certain. But in Einstein's gamma, the V and C stand for velocities with respect to the observer, not the medium. So if any manner of uncertainty can be shown to have crept into these values, it will reflect across every other type of measurement the theory has to offer. Indeed, it is this clue which will point us towards unraveling the remaining mysteries of relativity. Mysteries such as length contraction or the relativity of simultaneity. Placing us just steps away from being able to give physical intuition to the entirety of the theory. Meaning very soon, for the first time, we will be in possession of an interpretation that doesn't rely on mathematical abstraction. Now, a huge shout out here to our Patreon subscribers, through whose support we've been able to bring these recent revelations to light. And to all our viewers who have countenanced our search for real answers over the years. We hope your excitement for what lies ahead is as great as ours. This has been Dialect. Stay tuned.